Hi, this is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the soundbite. I'm once again alone in the studio. The boys are somewhere. Who knows? But anyway, my guest today is Erica Bundy Reddick, who is an independent candidate for Burlington City Council. This is the first time we've um, uh, it, uh, interviewed somebody for the council, and I'm very excited about oh, it. Welcome. Thank you. Long stretch here. Thank you. Thank you. Because um, we said we'd uh, give the floor to candidates. So if you're interested, come on. And Burlington has played such an important part in Vermont's economy and just being there for shopping. It has yeah. stores. I love it. <laughs> but can you share a little bit with our viewers of who you are and your background and why you want to jump in? Yeah, that's uh, my name. Well, again, Erica Reddick. Uh, my background, I born and raised in Vermont, had the uh, pleasure and privilege to get to move to Texas about 10 years ago, kind of see a different way of doing politics and government. Right. And then my husband and I moved to Los Angeles because he's a filmmaker, so right. seeing the polar opposite right. of Texas. And then in moving back to Vermont and seeing that Vermont is going the way of California and how that has really decimated the economy of that state and how much it's harmed people. It really sort of spurred this um, desire to try to make a difference. Right. And so when we, you know, we moved back here to buy my grandparents' house in Burlington, started to see how convoluted <laughs> the regulatory environment is here right. started learning more about what was going on in the government and things like that and I just said you know I can't not say something right. uh, if no one else in Burlington is willing to stand up and say what is true and what is right then I'm going to good for you thanks good. well <laughs> that council is in the news a lot for a variety of different reasons yes. but it's a very active Council, it's, yes. I guess the structure is mayor council, right? It's a mayor council sort of thing. So what's the role the mayor, does he report to the council or what's the, um, the relationship there? Actually, it's really interesting and I'm learning more and more about what historically had to take place for Burlington to essentially become a little mini dictatorship. So the mayor, as an example, has control or a say over the fire department, who the fire chief is, right. the police chief and the fire department. So most cities across the country, as an example, the police chief does not report to the mayor. Uh -huh. He is another elected official. He's appointed by the council or some other body, right. Right. Um, police commission, something like that so that that position is not used for political purposes, which it often is right. in, in Burlington, sure. unfortunately. Right. Same with the fire department, yeah. with the public safety tax we'll talk about later. Yes. Um, and the city council, interestingly enough, should be able to, and theoretically does have the ability yeah. to override the mayor's uh, initiatives to veto his budget and do things like that, right, right. but they don't. Uh, so the mayor may be a Democrat, yeah. but he's very much a progressive, mm -hmm. and so is much of the council. Right. And what happens is not only is the council overrepresented by progressives, the mayor is a progressive. He then gets to appoint these very large and important um, other department heads, right. and additionally then the city council and the mayor get to approve who goes on the commissions. Uh, so all the commissions sure. and committees right. Right. are overrepresented yeah. and almost completely um, staffed or filled, I don't know what right. the right word is, by progressives. Right. Not much balance. No balance. Right. No balance at all. And so in a city that talks a lot about diversity and the need for diversity and inclusion, that does not include conservatives or Republicans. Those, the, we don't need that kind of diversity <laughs> in Burlington, apparently. I love it. So that's a good time to my next question because I read in several different places, you're a conservative libertarian, said so in the print, but I don't know if it's <laughs> running as an independent, but you were also included in the list of ag-Republican uh, ag candidates, which um, is something John Clark had started yes. uh, with the people that he's recruited to run. 
um, which I must give him credit for. He there was about eleven when you were at that yeah. uh, event at the state house. There was about eleven new people never involved in politics who he got to jump in. Yeah, which I think is great. It is. So, well, well, how does that all blend together all to fit. make uh, make you who you are? That's a great question, and I was uh, misquoted as saying I'm a conservative libertarian. What I said was I'm a liberal conservative. Oh. And that's well, that not makes, your fault. That makes sense. Um, I did read it. I know. I Well, I commented on the article and I said, hey, you misquoted me. Um, because I think when you say conservative in Vermont, that means a lot of things. And, and uh, unfortunately, I think our national politics has sort of muddied the waters uh, in local politics, unfortunately. Right. People have a lot of opinions about what's going on nationally, I understand, but those things don't, af not that they don't affect us locally, but to me, you know, what's going on at the White House and in the legislature, if we're gonna talk about local elections, we need to talk about what are the local issues and what are people's exactly. stances on the local issues? Right. Because that's what we have control over here. Right. So I say, I joke and I say I'm a liberal conservative because like most Vermonters, I was raised that you don't care about what goes on behind closed doors. You know, it's, it is not my business who you choose to sleep with who you're in love with, whatever, as long as you're not hurting other people right, right, or me right. or encroaching on my constitutional rights, you do Go you, <laughs> I'm a do me, right. you know, as they say. Uh, and, that's, and that's how it should be. You know, I, that's how I was raised right. with those values and that's how I think it should be. So now in order to maintain that liberalism, you have to be a conservative. You have to value freedom of speech, freedom of, of, of assembly, right. second amendment rights that protect all of the other rights. If you don't value the constitutional basis of this republic, then you don't actually value those liberal ideas because mm -hmm. without them, you don't get to say what you want. You don't get to say what you think. Right. You know, if you are, as an example, if you are somebody who thinks that all conservatives are racist, sexist, homophobic bigots, Right. You, you missed can, a few. I had to look one up <laughs> when I heard the di, di, you know the diatribe that they use. I actually had to look a word up because it, I didn't know it. It's but, true. Yeah. And and so conservatives will fight for you to insult us. We will fight for you to say horrible things <laughs> right. about us because we believe that it is your right in the public square to say what you believe to be true. Right. But they won't do that. They won't do that. They're mm. going to fight and try to tell you that whatever you say is hate speech if they don't like it. Right. And then you will be shunned from the public square. And now in Burlington particularly, Vermont generally, but Burlington particularly, there's no freedom of assembly. There's no freedom of speech. There's none of that. Because if you now, do... Why, why do you say no freedom of assembly um, or speech? What are, do you have examples? Oh, of, oh, really? I could, oh, I could give you a hundred examples. Oh. But the most recent one that you'll find on like WCAX and yeah. stuff like that was there's a group called, uh, I think it's called Gender Integrity. I've tried to find more information. I tried calling the mayor's office. I tried calling the library. I said, maybe I'm missing something that is going on with this group that yeah. I haven't been able to find, so I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt. Please tell me why they're so awful. So this group, Gender Integrity, wanted to have a meeting at the Fletcher Free Library, right. a publicly funded right. place. Yes. Open to the public. Right. Okay, so they wanted to have a meeting to discuss their concerns about trans rights. The, the woman in charge, first of all, the um, oh my God, I can't remember her name. I think it's like Lair or something is her last name, is a lesbian, a feminist, a mm -hmm. hardcore feminist lesbian, right. okay? So she's like supposedly included in this progressive group. Yep. So she wanted to have a conversation about trans rights overtaking women's rights mm. and the loss of, of protected spaces for women with things like the Equality Act and stuff right. like that. Uh, part of the other concern that she wanted to discuss and just talk about, because these are really hard right, questions right. that we have to wrestle with as a community. She wanted to talk about the, I, the uh, legislation that they're trying to lower the age where you can transition. 
So start taking hormones, get gender reassignment surgery and all that. So they want to lower the age from 21. To, to what? I think 18. Oh, okay. Which, Which, I mean, this is a major, major life decision. Yes. I don't know a lot of 18 year olds who make good decisions. Right. Right. period right. let's be real I did dumb stuff when I was 18 I think we all did yes. and I'm not saying that transitioning is dumb I'm just saying that when you are gonna make a life-altering decision that comes with health consequences right. and all kinds of things yeah. it's not a decision you can easily reverse exactly say, just kidding I you know I've done this for a year or two and now I want yeah, right. to go you back. Make sure that is who you are. So they got so much pushback and they were bullied so badly that they canceled the meeting. Oh, that's terrible. And now the woman won't respond to any inquiries from anyone right. to oh. ask questions yeah. about what happened. I was going to say that just today there's a, several women's families who, it was high school kids who ran in a race with uh, several transgender um, women who are men and of course all the men won the won the races and the women were a little upset about it because they uh, which I didn't think about they were losing out on high sc uh, college scholarships scholarships yeah. um, potential to go on to other higher sure, levels yeah, even not in college right. exactly right and so uh, they filed a lawsuit today which I thought was interesting I think that yeah. we all I shouldn't say we all I want to be compassionate, and I am. If we're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I'm gonna treat you with the same dignity and respect as I would treat anyone. Right. Because every human being deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. We don't have to argue that. No right. one, I'm, I, I know there are probably some really terrible people who would argue that, right. but You're we're wrong. not talking about that. Right. We're talking about good, kind-hearted people who are concerned, who are afraid for their own rights to be taken away, who are afraid for their own privileges to be taken away. Women and young girls get to learn how to fight, how right. to take care of their right. bodies, right. how to, I mean, literally. Right. One of the reasons that boys benefit from the being able to wrestle and do things like that is because they learn how to fight and, and um, control their own power. So when little girls, this, I've told people this forever. You want, you want to stop sexual harassment, you want to stop girls from getting raped and sexually assaulted and all those things, put every single little girl in a Taekwondo class. There you go. Or a right. Krav Maga or something yeah. like that. Teach them how to use their weight. Teach them how to fight for themselves. Right. Teach them the confidence and the courage to defend themselves. Yeah. Right. And we won't have nearly the problems that we do with the gender you know, right. issues. Right. Because women will have learned how to take care of themselves, how to compete, that they're capable. Women learn those things just like boys do from competition, from sports. Right. And if you set up a scenario where now women and girls are having to compete against biological boys, you have now eliminated their ability to have the same benefit that the boys That's do. That's an interest. I love the, the way you're looking at this issue. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> no, that's really, I hadn't looked at it that way. That's, that's great. It is, and yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous to talk about it even because... But it makes sense. This is one of those topics that if you say anything that yeah, is right, not yeah. outside, yeah. Right. I mean, I will get ripped to shreds for this, for saying the thing that is obvious. Right. And what happened out of that? They canceled their event. The Gender Integrity canceled their event because of the backlash. And then Councilwoman Freeman brought a resolution to city council. It wasn't pre-announced. It wasn't even read at the city council. Oh, it wasn't Con warned? Ooh. Condemning hate speech, condemning these people for even wanting to have a conversation mm. about their fears and their concerns about their rights and their safe spaces and our children. Now see, I'm, my impression of Burlington is completely opposite than what you're just explaining. I think it's an open whatever, you know, it was. whatever you want. It, yeah. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, that's okay. It was. Hmm. When I was growing up, I, I grew up in uh, Milton, graduated mm -hmm. high school in St. Albans, lived in Burlington in middle school, so I went to Lyman C. Hunt, right. graduated Champlain College, lived there and worked there since I was 18. Yep. Burlington was the place that everyone could go and let their freak for flag sure. fly 
and it didn't matter. Right. And everybody was it welcome. It was the charm of the place. You know, you'd walk down Church Street and you were surrounded by lots of different people and it was great. I moved, when I moved to Austin, Texas, they have this, um, they have this little saying, it says, keep Austin weird. <laughs> and I was like, I'd look around and be like, y'all have clearly never been outside of Texas because if you think this is weird, you have no idea. Come, <laughs> Come to Burlington to or San Francisco yeah. or something and right. see. And that is, and that was the beauty of it. Right. You know, growing up, we had a senator that was a Republican, a senator that was a Democrat, and a, a socialist independent as right. our representative. Exactly. Right. That was Vermont to me. Yeah. And I used to brag to people, you know, I was raised that you vote for a politician based on the content of their character, not their genitalia, the color of their skin, right. uh, or all of these immutable characteristics that we decided a long, yeah. a long time ago were not appropriate ways to judge people. Right. Right. And yet somehow in the 10 years that I was gone, it we changed. flipped back to yeah. that. And now your opinion only matters based on the color of your skin, the nature of your genitalia, who you choose right. to have sex with, and all of those other right. things. And we don't even ask what you stand for, right? We don't ask those policy It doesn't questions. matter. That's right. I it know, doesn't I'm matter. Right with you. Yep, it's, it's shocking to me. Yeah. So I may have been able to answer this question myself. What, what do you think? Because there's quite a few people running, I'm yeah. understanding. And there's a write-in um, for Kurt. And I know you, in one article I read, you said you weren't going to run if Kurt was running. And so he said he wasn't running because he's doing this radio show or TV show. TV yep, show. it's a radio show. A radio show. And um, so he would have to stop the show because of uh, uh, federal laws. So right. he said, no, but now somebody's instigated a write-in campaign, which I don't, that's real. When you think about it, you can't really show the difference between you and he because you can't debate. Nope. Hmm. So I, I, don't, I don't know what I think about that. But anyways, <laughs> my question was, what do you bring to the table that others don't I know Matt Coda's running? Do you know Matt Coda in Ward Four? Oh, is, oh I wonder. No, no, in uh, for the council, but maybe it's South Burlington. Never mind that okay. comment. Um, but um, what? How do you stand out from the others? Oh my goodness! Uh, <laughs> what I do you stand tell out folks? wildly. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, it's really funny. We did our first candidate forum on uh, CCTV Channel yeah. Seventeen, and I laughed after because Sarah Carpenter and I could not be more opposite. Every question, almost every question was about right. taxes and the economy. Yeah. And I, you know, do you support the tax increase? I said no to all of them. Right. She said yes to all of them. Uh, she has spent her career, uh, you know, I don't know a lot about her, so I don't mean to sound like I'm disparaging right. because I'm sure she's a lovely woman, but her career has been spent figuring out how to spend taxpayer dollars, how to get more in taxpayer funding, how to get right. more out of the government in order to redistribute that wealth. Right. I have spent my career helping businesses grow right. and thrive, you're avoid an bankruptcy. By trade, yes. right? And you have your own business? I do. Firm. Yeah, that's yep. Cool. I have an accounting consultancy called I Love Your Money. Oh, I love it. That's <laughs> great. And, uh, you know, what I do is work with small to medium-sized businesses, often who spent a few years trying to save money by having their mother-in-law do their bookkeeping. Oh, right. You know, mm -hmm. and now it's, it's three years later and they can't get funding yeah. because it says they have negative $500,000 in accounts receivable and they can't figure out why. Thanks, mom. Yeah, and it's like, okay, yeah, you probably don't owe your clients a half a million dollars. Right, right. I mean, this was an actual thing that happened. Oh, really? Oh, yes, oh, oh yeah. So, you know, a lot of times it's QuickBooks bills itself as this great software that anybody can use. But if you don't have a bachelor's degree in accounting, right. if you don't understand debits and credits, if you don't understand the economy and taxes and right. business regulations, don't it doesn't do it. matter how easy the buttons are right. to push. Right. Right. Um, so I work with a lot of folks, like I have one client in particular, we started working together. He had two employees, he used no time management software, he had no idea how long his projects were taking, he was nearly bankrupt. Five years later, he has 10 employees, oh, you know, a, a nice chunk of change in the bank that will be buying his own office space Re with. excellent. Exactly. Right. Um, 
you know, just completely turned around. And that's what I really love to that's do. That's great. It's really fun. Well, that would be an asset to Burlington. Yeah. <laughs> Challenge the, what are you doing? Yes. Are you getting your money's worth out of it? I really often ask myself, I'm like, and this is, I, I, this is totally rude, and I know it is, but <laughs> every time I go to city council and I see, like, the housing initiatives right. and things like that, I'm like, do you, do you guys not do math? Right. right. It, this is basic addition right. and subtraction. I'm not sure why you think any of this stuff is a good idea. Right. And I think that, I think that we have a council and a mayor who are compassionate. Yes, that, that is true, right. And they care about people. Yep. What seems to be missing is the ability to regulate and say no and be realistic about what's possible right. and what's not. Right. So we want to help everyone, right? And um, I learned this term, it's called pathological compassion. Right, so we just want to be nice to everyone and we want to do everything that we can and we want everybody to be okay. And that is an awesome goal. I love that goal. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can't, but you no, have to you pay can't. for it. Right. You have to pay right. for it. And so, well, we'll get to the next. I'll right. let you ask All the right. next question. No, that's okay. <laughs> I just, um, is, is, are people leaving Burlington as they are in the rest of the state? Do you have those numbers? I'm just curious about that. I actually don't know the numbers off of yeah, the top of my head, but Chittenden County is the only place that's growing. Growing. Well, because there's opportunity there, so it's, people can make the money to pay the taxes. It's and, the only place with yeah, jobs. Right. It's the only place. I shouldn't say the only place. Mm -hmm. I know that's hyperbole. But it's one of the only, other than the right. Northeast Kingdom, which I think still has some good manufacturing gigs yep, and stuff right. like that. Uh, it's the only place that is has an industry to support people. Um, now that being said, we aren't growing as much as we might be if yeah. the state weren't struggling so much. Right. And in fact, part of the reason that we are having an exodus of people is because of Burlington. Um, so you know, as goes Burlington, so goes because, the rest of the state, right. or as goes Chittenden County, so yeah. goes the rest of the state. So when you have, this, this, this is another way I can point out the difference between Sarah and Kurt and I. Right. Sarah in the candidate forum the other uh, last week said, you know, we need to have the state redo the housing, or excuse me, the education funding, because we have special issues here in Burlington that they don't have in the rest of the state, and we need more money. Sign them up. <laughs> right? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, right. Right, except that that education funding, that increase in education funding, comes from the rest of the state. Yes. Right. So Burlington has made decisions to strangle its economy so yeah. that we don't have enough money, Burlington has made decisions to bring uh, low-income people who have to be taken care of with social welfare services. Yeah. Um, Burlington has made these decisions that have created the problems and now expect the rest of the state to pay for right. it. Right. So poorer communities like Fletcher and Westford right. or whoever, we have the gall to expect them to pay our bills right. when it's our own fault that we're struggling financially? Yes. I don't know how I you like justify that. that. I like this, keep, keep talking. <laughs> because uh, the one thing I got involved in in this, the legislature was the cleanup of Lake Champlain. Yeah. There's a lot of people who said that's Burlington's problem, let them pay, and I'm, I'm one of the, on the, in this particular instance, because I agree with what you said, that the lake has such an impact on us, the state, from an economy uh, perspective, that I think the rest of the state should pitch in and help clean, because the lake, the lake is so important to all of us. Agreed. Even if it's not in my backyard and I can't see it, but it's close enough, and, yeah. and it attracts people, and so that, you can, you can quote me, but I, that's the one I would share in, because we, if we don't clean that lake up, I think we're doomed. Well, and that's, actually an interesting conversation too. I recently learned that part of the reason we're having such a hard time with phosphorus, there was a federal program mm -hmm. early in the 20th century mm -hmm. where the federal government was telling farmers uh -huh. to put phosphorus on their land. 
so exactly. now so now we're punishing farmers yeah, for and putting them out of business for something that's actually the federal government's fault exactly yeah and so i have a conversation with people a lot about our relationship with the federal government because as you may know vermont is a state that gets more in federal funds than we give so we get more in grants and mm -hmm, things like mm -hmm. that than we actually contribute to the general fund. Mm. So we are a receiver state is what they say. And so I've spoken to a lot of, a lot of legislators and people like Sarah who would yep. say, well, we have all this money, we get all this federal grant, we need to be able to whatever. Those come with costs and consequences right. later down the road. Right. I would be willing to bet you any money that that phosphorus program yep. came with some other benefit. We had to contribute something. It yep. probably meant something. And now decades later, we're suffering the consequences for being willing to take that yep. hand out. Very few people remember that, uh, the federal government and phosphorus. And when we were having the discussion around the state, you'd bring it up and they'd be like, what, what, what? Exactly. You know, it's, well, the, it's the farmer's fault. It's, fix it. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just people are not willing to learn history right. oh, well. before they make their decisions. Yep. And, and I would just pose again, the fact that Vermont gets more federal funds than we give is our fault. Yeah. It's our fault. So we make laws that cause businesses to leave. Mm -hmm. We raise taxes so that people leave. We raise the regulatory burdens so that building anything costs you $100,000 right. in Act 250 permits right. before you've even started. Right. And then, so Vermonters, or our legislature, mm -hmm. is the reason that Vermont is poor. And then we have the expectation, because we want it to be green, or we want whatever, and then we have the gall to tell the rest of the country that it's their responsibility to subsidize our way of life. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. That's crazy to me. And yeah, they don't get it, the legislators. No, no. Wait, and wait till you see the new Act 250 bill that's just got, it's gotten out of committee and it's going over to, um, I think, maybe House GovOps or Ways and Means and then to the Senate. It's just a dandy. A couple hundred pages. It's great. It's cra And that's what, yeah. so Vermonters, in addition to our legislature, city council, Burlington residents actually believe, whether they realize it or not, that it is the rest of the country's responsibility to pay for us to have clean air and yeah. water and all of that stuff, not ours. Right. And that is just a very immature way of thinking well, about money. Well, that's sort of the same, as you're saying, it's sort of the same thing where a lot of people think the government should take care of us. You know, right here in Vermont, well, they should take care of us rather than let me work and contribute. And take care of same, myself, take care of my family. Work, right? yeah. yeah. Oh, not in my family. <laughs> I talked to somebody the other day. I've been working since 1964. If you figure that out, that's a long time. <laughs> so tell me, um, I've read a couple of things, but what is your main, the main focus? I'm running on the platform, whether it's schools, taxes. Um, I don't know how much you're involved in the opioid crisis, but. Um, yeah. So schools, taxes, uh, well, schools as it relates to taxes. Yes, right. Local control for sure. But uh, tax, property tax relief, uh, property tax reform, uh, the, it, stimulating the economy, and public health and safety. Ah. And public health and safety actually doesn't get a lot of attention because everything has been so focused on the economy and yeah. taxes. But m also partially because without the money to pay for public safety. Yes, you can't do much. Right, right. So everything really starts with a foundation of a strong economy where we have good businesses that provide good jobs yeah. with multiple layers of uh, pay and experience needed. You know, we want the executives that get paid a couple hundred thousand right. dollars or more, but then we need the, the blue collar workers. Right. We need the entry level jobs for our teenagers and are those right out of college, things like that. Yeah. So we need a good, robust business environment so that people want to do business here. When we bring that economic activity back, right. we'll have the tax base we need to lower taxes and pay for exactly. uh, things like public safety. Yep. And, and one may, of the you main may save on guns because one of your council people proposed 
no guns. There's a savings right off the top. <laughs> <laughs> I was really impressed with that. I went, oh my goodness. Well, and what's wild what is, is that? at the same time they want to disarm the police yeah. and disarm the populace with gun laws, they're also releasing violent criminals. Yeah, right, exactly. They're yeah. not locking up, you right. know, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I had someone share an experience with me, a police officer, who had arrested someone for domestic violence. This is in Burlington. Yeah. Had arrested someone for domestic violence. They pick them up, they bring them in, uh, call the judge, hey, we picked up so and so, yeah, right. we gotta, you know, whatever. Uh, judge says, no custody, release them, have them show up to court tomorrow. So he's just beating <laughs> yeah, yeah. his girlfriend. Right. Oh, and he just gets released yeah. immediately, yeah. same night. Goes back same night, beats her up again, get the cops called again, they pick him up again, bring him down. Call the same judge, hey judge, we just picked him up again, he beat her up again, what's up? Judge says, no, 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 let him go, more conditions. He goes back a third time. Oh my God. Nearly kills her. Whoa. This mm. time, we'll remand him to custody. What a great guy. But this idea yeah. that yeah. like, Oh, everybody! We're not going to incar. We're going to decarcerate violent criminals because right, right. so so you're going to release violent criminals on the street. You're going to make it so the police can't do their job, and I'm not allowed to protect myself either. Right. What? what? Right. How is that anything other than insanity? Yeah. Did you go to the um, the jail discussion over at uh, from VT Digger? Unfortunately, I did not get to oh, attend. Well. It's on, it's on, you've got to watch it. It's, it's on, oh. it's on VT Diggers, uh, the whole thing. One, oh. of, one of them, who shall remain nameless, because I'm going to do a show on this, said that in domestic violence, if the person kills the partner, chances are he will never reoffend again. So, <laughs> you had to be there. So, because uh, the whole audience is clapping, except for me and the, the two friends on either side of me, and we were just sitting there going, what? Because they, and, and you should never lock up women because they've, they've been abused and they've, you know, never mind what they did to their kid. So I'm you gonna- should Go listen to that one, that's a dandy. So one of the reasons that public health and safety in right. this whole thing is so important to me is because I'm a recovering addict. I'll celebrate 11 years sober in March. Congratulations, Thank seriously. you, thank you very much. I, having actually been a drug addict and understanding what is required to get well, right. and having worked very closely with other addicts to help them get sober, this idea that everyone is just the victim of society, right. and that with a little therapy, people will stop right. human trafficking, people will stop harming each other, people will stop whatever, is baseless and completely unfounded. Right. I, I literally do not understand and cannot comprehend where this idea comes from. Because if you ask anyone in recovery, anyone who was a criminal and got uh, reformed, absolute, there is not a single one who will say, you know how I got better? By the society turning a blind eye to what I did, allowing me to continue to terrorize people on the street right. and tell me that I'm just the victim and that nothing is my responsibility. Because he had a bad childhood. That's, no one has like, got beat up. And blah, no blah, blah. one has ever gotten well that right. way. And I can tell you for a fact that no one ever will. Because the way that you as a recovering addict or a criminal, somebody who's been in jail and all these other, right. the way that you earn your dignity back is by taking responsibility for what you've done. Right. No one gets better any other way. You have to hit rock bottom. You can't have people telling you that it's okay to sleep in other people's yards and in their places of business. You can't tell people that it's okay to behave badly. Right. You can't tell people that they get to commit human trafficking, trespassing, right. theft, and all of those things and that they're just the victim of society and expect them to get well. Right. You have, they have to hit rock bottom, which normally includes some kind of interaction with the police right. or something like that to get right. smacked awake. 
well, what kills me about the police these days is they are almost asking that instead of being law enforcement, that they're being uh, social, social workers. workers. I mean, I had a, I, here at the studio, we did an eight part series on opioids, the treatment, prevention, just, and enforcement, wellness. And the, the law enforcement people we had on here is like, they, they don't want us to enforce the law, they want us to be social workers and, and confront the issues right there and then. And that's and not what they're trained to do. Sure. Well. That is not what they're trained to do. And frankly, to be perfectly honest, I don't want the police to care about my feelings. I want them to care about my safety. There you go. I yeah. want them to make sure that I'm okay. And if I'm a danger to myself and others, I want them to be responsible for that. If I am a danger to myself and others, right. Please save me from myself. There you go. And if that means arresting me and throwing me in jail, which for me personally, that is what happened. Right. Ah. That was the beginning of me getting to see that the way that I was living was not working. Right. But I, like many Vermonters, grew up or were living in a place where we were losing our ability to make jobs, there's, you don't see the opportunity yeah. uh, to raise a family and afford things. You don't have a lot of hope. Right, right. And then, unfortunately, some of us have bad things that happen to us. Mm -hmm. So as an example, or f my personal experience, I was drugged and sexually assaulted in my early 20s. Mm. And that led to a lot of not good emotional issues, as you would imagine. Mm -hmm. And that definitely contributed to me turning to drugs and alcohol to deal with the pain and the suffering that was caused by that. But I will never in a million years tell you that it was because of that that I became a drug addict and an alcoholic. It's not because of that that I committed a crime and had to suffer the consequences. It was because I didn't have I'm gonna restate that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I've had a lot of bad things happen to me in my life. Not sure how to respond, but I'm very sorry well, for no, all this. But it doesn't make me a victim. Well, you can sense that just hearing you talk. Because as a, as a grown person, you know, maybe when I was a teenager and I got bullied so badly that I had to drop out of high school my senior year, oh, wow. I would have thought of myself as a victim back then when I got drugged and sexually assaulted and then re-victimized by the judicial system, I probably would have told you I was a victim back then. Mm. Any number of bad things that have happened to me in my life, I could choose to see myself as a victim and use that as an excuse for bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I did for a long time because I was told right. that I was a victim. The victim. Right. And when you tell people that you're a victim, that they're a victim, you take away their agency to change their lives and to get better. Mm. And if at any point in that period of time, I had had a guidance counselor or someone else, right. instead of saying, Erica, you are a victim, you should wallow in self-pity and feel awful about yourself. If somebody had at any point said to me, Erica, you are not a victim, and here's why. Here's how you can turn this around. Here's what that looks like. Mm. I needed a mentor in my life to help guide me and shape those right. things. I didn't need the government telling me that I was a victim right. and that I didn't have to take responsibility for myself. Mm. And it wasn't until I had someone who was willing to be that mentor. Right. It wasn't until I got smacked down by my drug addiction. It wasn't until I had to fully suffer the consequences of the choices I had made right. that I got to make a different decision. And now look at you, very impressive, seriously. <laughs> thank I mean, you. I, I, I'm not sure, I, I've never had, thank, thank you, never had any of these experiences because I think my father would have killed me, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so we, just, we just ended it, Dad. But um, I, I've lived, I have lived a very sheltered, I've been out in the public and worked for state government, but for some reason I've just been in this little bubble. And some of the things that people say to me, I'm like, what? I just, I listen and I try to understand, but it's hard sometimes because you haven't, thank God, experienced it, but I give you a lot of credit. Well, and the best we Seriously. can do is, is be empathetic. Yep. 
And of course, I make the joke all the time that everyone in Burlington and our legislature basically has to go to Al-Anon. And I'm probably not supposed to say that on <laughs> like public television but, or whatever. But what is missed about people struggling with drug addiction and alcoholism is that you can't save them. Unless they want to be saved, right? Right. You cannot, right. it doesn't matter how much money you throw at the problem, right. it do, they have to decide for right. themselves. Right. So by, as an example, by letting people just sleep on the street and in the foyers of buildings and, and really decimating right. what is left of the economic activity in Burlington, you lower the bottom. Right. And so they have to get even worse and fall even further before they have that moment where they wake up. Right. And so if, if people could just understand that what they believe is compassion is actually more harmful, yeah. I think we could start to see something different. Sure. Now you must see, along with all of that, um, we had a, a pol um, guy who does politics, you know, always talking about politics, giving his insight into it. And I asked him in the show, I said, What's, what do you see in Vermont as the worst thing that we're going to be dealing with? And he said homelessness which really, speaking of the bubble, uh, I was like, what are you talking about? And he said homelessness because it's also uh, food insecurity, um, mental illness, it's all wrapped up into one which, which is about um, if somebody's got a roof over their head and um, a place to live and feel safe, which is what you're talking about. And they can yeah. take care of their family, right, exactly. have enough to do, be a part of a community, right. be together. So he said that's what he sees in our future that is just gonna be devastating. Absolutely. Well, and the and the policies that are being followed and pushed just make it worse. Huh. All you have to do is look at Los Angeles, oh, Portland, oh, Austin. So lived in Austin, Texas, lived in Los Angeles. I, I can't imagine what it really looks like. I, I'm appalled by the pictures. So to actually see it and the speaking of the police, they're going in and having to work with these folks. And, and being a part of the recovery community for right, 11 years right. and going to these homeless encampments, praying for people, bringing right. them food, bringing them things. When you allow homeless encampments, you are creating a place for disease yep. at, at minimum. Right. Okay, the, the least bad thing, there's a typhus outbreak in in Los Angeles, oh, I know, for God's sake. Which we haven't seen in hundreds of years, right? Like. I'm trying to, when I start talking about well, this, I, I get super that. excited. I'm just like, ah, oh, because it makes me crazy. It's, it's so obvious. Why don't they? It's, and not, not only that, but you set up a circumstance for people to be victimized. Right. Because sure. this is, women are getting raped and sexually assaulted rampantly. And so are men. Yeah. You know, oh. so men and women are being raped and sexually assaulted. They're being sex trafficked. They're selling themselves. And there must be kids in that mix. That would just, uh, I'd be adopting them all. And so, so again, this, uh, this pathological compassion right. that I'm not saying that arresting mentally ill people is awesome. Right. I'm not saying that arresting drug addicts and putting them in jail is awesome or super effective. But what we're doing is not working. Right. And I would love to see something like what Rhode Island has, which is essentially like work camps. Yes, they were talking about that the other night. But which sounds awful and are not great and have their own problems, for sure. We are human beings right? and we screw stuff up. That is all there is to yeah. it. Give them some kind of trade, give them counseling while they're in there. Don't just put them in the, in the cell and close the door. There's an awesome organization in South, it's located in South Burlington called Working Fields. So two, I'm gonna plug, um, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Working Fields is a staffing agency. The executive director's name is uh, Mickey Wiles. Hmm. He is, you. if you can, I mean, I know it's not I'm, politics, but awesome. Well, I, we do a lot of shows not politics because I find them interesting. Awesome guy, awesome organization. They work to help drug addicts and ex-cons right. get jobs. Right. right. Because you know how people stay sober? When they what? have a purpose. Yes, right. And they have dignity right. and integrity. So they are working with local employers, Vermont employers, all right. across the state 
to staff to get people in recovery into jobs and to be that foundation for That's them to great. get well. Love it, love Mickey, they're awesome. Huh. And then in Burlington you have a new place, the executive director is Kevin Pounds, and it's a homelessness shelter. Uh. So they have a long-term program on North Street, and then he's now also, they're also in charge of the low barrier shelter. And their whole thing is about what, it's not just giving them a bed. Right. It's having recovery coaches, helping yes, them right, get jobs. Right. They have a whole program that you can go through. It's like six months to a year, and they even help you get apartments at the end That's and great. the whole thing. That's great. So I have, I'm actually working with a new place because I have a triplex in Burlington. I told them, right. when I have an opening, I would like to consider renting to one of your Super, people. Right. Because I had people who were willing to invest in me right. and give me a second chance at my life so that I got to right. be sitting here today. Pay it forward. Exactly. Good for you. Love those organizations. Yeah. So we have, um, looking at the time, and I want to I want to focus a little bit on um, the council. Yes, and, and yes. And all of the, I, I made a list up, I, don't, I know, I send it to you, of all the stuff you've got going on in Burlington. I'm sure <laughs> I've, just, I've just touched the surface, but, um, uh, are people, when you go around, when you have that, uh, what they call it, livability forums, um, <laughs> they had about four or five of them, right? Have you done yours yet, or? Um, I, I attended one. Yeah. I attended one of them. Um, and so what are people saying are their issues? What, what do the, what does, uh, some of them didn't look too well attended, but that's always the way it is when you're campaigning. Well, yeah. It, it's hard to get people out. Yes. So, but what are the folks that did show? What were they saying? Well, now, are you talking about our candidate forums, or are yeah, you talking about the, the housing summit? No, 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 the candidate forums. Oh, okay. Because the council uh, supported that, and it looked like they had just a couple of candidates in this one and this one. Because you're from, you, I think you mentioned Ward 4. Yes. Which is really the north district. Yes, so end. we are the, the west side of North Avenue, or the lake ah. side of North ah, Avenue okay. is Ward 4. Um, so we have just had the one candidate forum, and almost every single question, I think, with the exception of one silly one that I can remember, somebody asked me if I was related to Ted Bundy. I was oh, like, stop. <laughs> I was like, I was so off. excited when I married my husband to right. take his right. last name, yeah, and right. I was like, I'm never going to hear these stupid jokes ever again, uh, but it's whatever. Um, but every single question was about the economy and taxes. Now, that, that, see, that's, that's where we've experienced statewide. And do you think when they get to the legislature, they've all heard the same thing from their constituents, nope. and we do just the opposite? I actually, I kind of yelled at one of my city councilors, <laughs> and I, 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 after the last, one of the last city council meetings, where they voted to put the I think it was the public, uh, the Burlington Housing Trust Fund on the ballot. C Council voted to go right, ahead and put it right. on the ballot. And I went to Franklin Polino after, who's the North District City Councilor, uh -huh. and I said, you know, you come to all these meetings and you say, I hear you, we oh, hear you, right. I hear you. All of them say that. Right. All so of them don't say do it. anything. But then you still vote for the thing that we tell you we can't afford. Right. So, so you don't hear us. Right. And you don't actually care what they we hear, want. They don't or we listen. Need. I think that's a. They don't compute. Exactly. One ear and out the other. And I think that um, Councilman um, Ali Zhang, Ward Seven, was the only one who voted against it. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. And he yeah. and I disagree on tons of stuff. Yeah. But he listened. Hmm. And I was like, that's the only one of you that actually listened to your people. Hmm. So, and what is your? What? Who are your people? What is your ward? consist of what is because I think in Burlington I've noticed there's cultural there's cultural components here and here and here and I I'm assuming every ward has got a little nuance and and different than the other wards yes yeah. the new north end is very different than the rest of the city in that it's primarily owner occupied single family homes right so there's obviously duplexes and uh, you know triplexes some apartment buildings and apartment complexes right. but not nearly to the extent that you have in the rest of the city. Mm -hmm. So we are primarily older uh, 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 Vermonters, so right. people who are retired on fixed incomes, young families, and, uh, and that, I mean, that's pretty much the demographic right. of the new North End. Is that for the where most the garden part. is or not? 
there used to be a um, a garden where people could go and plant things, or is that there's somewhere a, else in the city? I um, think there's multiples of them. Oh, I see. I okay, know so there's one there's, at the at the um, trailer park. Oh, okay. Across from the Ethan Allen Shopping yeah. Center, I know there's one there. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's a few around yeah. the city. Yeah, because they seem to have caught on. Because, you know, it's fun to watch, plant something, and then go home and eat it. How cool is that? Exactly. Yeah. And that's, I love, that's one of the values I, I tell people, like, my husband and my friends in Texas call me a food snob. <laughs> because growing up here, right? our, so much of our food is grown locally, yeah, raised locally. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I love it. And it's so much fresher and yeah. more delicious. Yeah. And you just realize how important our local farms yeah. are. Right. And, and what that means to our community. Yeah. I love to go to a restaurant where you're reading eggs came from, uh, you know, Erica Reddick's farm <laughs> in, in Williston or something. And you're exactly. like, Dad, this is so cool. Like I'm supporting, not only am I, first of all, supporting and, and, and really um, creating local farms is, I, I don't, I don't know why progressives want to do anything that hurts our local farms because what else helps with climate change right, right. than not having to transport our food from South America? There you go. With who knows what they put on it. Exactly. That's, that's, All the chemicals. I won't, I won't buy them. Because I think chemicals don't just stay on the outside, so you could, they actually go into the meat of the apple or exactly. whatever. Exactly. Yeah. We yeah. should really, I, I think rather than passing a bunch of legislation that is closing our family farms, we need to be supporting them as much as possible. Oh, I agree with that. Yeah. I had John Sales on here a couple of weeks ago, and he's from the food bank. Yeah. And they put this veggie truck together, and they go to schools with all kinds of vegetables that I think you can just take. They're, they're free, and there's people coming out of the woodwork to... To enjoy the fresh the fresh fruit that he offers, it's incredible. He yep. said. I love so that. you've got in your little town, you have such things as sanctuary city, oh, non-citizen voting, <laughs> um, which I don't know. I just struggle with that. I'm sure this is no surprise to my viewers. Um, where's your where are you take on that? Is that? That's already <laughs> done, so it's sort of hard to undo if you are not crazy about it. Uh, the sanctuary city part, yes. Yeah. Um, I. I find it very disappointing. And having just moved back from two states with the highest numbers of illegal immigrants, right. and not just illegal immigrants, but crime caused by illegal immigrants, right. um, it's unfortunate that in a lot of these conversations, legal and illegal immigrants, Illegal immigrants and criminal illegal immigrants, outside of having been here illegally, criminal, they all get conflated, mm -hmm. yep. right? So now, if you say anything about illegal immigrants and wanting to address safety, you're a racist right, and you're a right. whatever, right? Homophobic, blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 fill in the blank. <laughs> right. So my nephew is a Border Patrol agent in South oh, Texas. Tell him, thank you. So last year when everybody was saying that there was no crisis at the border and passing sanctuary city right. laws and all this stuff, I was like, uh, Matthew just told us a story about hundreds of people getting gunned down at a border checkpoint where he's stationed, near where he's stationed. So the in Texas especially, I'll speak because that's where my knowledge base is mostly. Yeah very porous border because sure, people right. go back and forth to right. go to school to go to work it's very much like we have here with with Canada Quebec. right exactly so, yeah. hundreds of people in line waiting to go to school waiting to go to work all just murdered by the cartels oh wow and they run the border the and, entire and did length. we hear anything about that not no. a single word right but we can't talk about that yeah we can't talk about the illegal immigrants that are coming into the country who are MS-13 gang members, right. who are running drugs, who are human trafficking. We just had a human trafficking ring broken up in Burlington. A sex trafficking ring. Actually. Really? For real. Like, actually. A sex trafficking ring was broken up in Burlington, Vermont. Oh, my God. But we're not going to concern ourselves with the people who are committing human trafficking. Right. That just seems very irresponsible to me. You're saying it so calmly. <laughs> That's really outrageous. It just is shocking. And yeah. I go, 
I, I think is is it five? Was it five out of the eight 9/11 bombers were had visa had overstayed their visas? Oh yeah, right. So yeah. so I guess we've forgotten about yeah, yes, we exactly. forgot about that. Well, I, my husband and I, it's a long story, and I don't want to waste any time. But we came through one of the the border crossings um, that a week later. Some of the terrorists for the for the um, World Trade Center came in the same place we did, and the guy, oh, okay, go ahead, and uh, I'm in my motorcycle with piles of stuff I bought, and I've got the black mask on. You couldn't even see whether I was red, blue, blue, green, yellow, whatever. Just pass me through. Yeah, and I and I said to Bruce, that was the weirdest. Doesn't don't they ask questions? Don't they care? Nope. It's really bad. Well, and just to point out, to be really clear, by and large, for the most part. ICE and immigration officials, when they were doing, as an example, when they would do ra raids right. in Texas, they weren't coming to find the illegal yeah, so, immigrant who who came here right. to pick apples right. in you know in the yeah, fall. Right, right. They're looking for the people who have already been committed or who have already committed a crime right. that the police have already dealt with. Right. Because and send them that's back. how they know they're here. Right. How else would they know they're here exactly. if not the cooperation of local and that's law pretty enforcement? Scary. We, went, we were visiting um, my husband's son in, in Arizona, and we went through Nogales. To, we were going by way of you know, to Florida. So we went through at nighttime. Whoa. It just when you look at the border and the dogs, and, and you can see Mexico over there, it was a little eerie feeling. It's wild. Like, it's so, wild. Listen, we have um, two minutes, and I want, I just would like you to talk to our audience and, you know, what you'd like to see happen to Berlin, what, Berlin, that's where I live, Burlington, what you, um, what you would bring to the table and hope to accomplish yeah. as your campaign, you know, stump speech. Yes. Um, sh and sh this is when I should this address the camera. camera. Right, exactly. Uh, what I hope to accomplish in Burlington is a massive deregulation of buildings, zoning, uh, of zoning is primarily. I want to see our economy opened up for the least among us to be able to survive. When taxes are so high and regulations are so high that you have to be wealthy or a huge business already to make it, that's not how we grow. That's not how we do better. And that's not how we keep young people so that we can make sure that there is enough money to take care of our older people, which is a major issue that we're gonna, that we're already seeing here in Vermont and in Burlington. So uh, deregulation as much and as widely as possible, encourage investment by locals and other folks, make sure that we can thrive and pay for all of the things that we need. I am happy to, provide all of the social services, have all of the recovery beds that we need, rebuild Memorial Auditorium, deal with the Moran plant. I want to do all of those beautiful, wonderful, compassionate things that everyone talks about. And I'm going to do it by creating an economy that allows for us to pay for it ourselves rather than going into, into debt or expecting the rest of the state or the country to pay for it. Bravo. Thank you very much. Yeah. I wish you a lot of luck. Thank I you. I heard that Moran plant. I'm like, still? That's, <laughs> honest to God. That, I, I started working in Burlington in, in 91. That's the big topic back then. Eight, still it it closed in the 80s. <laughs> that, that's, that's it ridiculous. closed in the 80s, for and God's sake. It's like every year, what are we going to do with the Moran plant? And, now, and the longer it goes, yeah, it the goes worse on. it gets, the I more the cost. Listen, I bet you enjoyed this uh, show. I certainly did, and I really want to thank our guests for coming. Very exciting. We're going to watch you. Burlington. Um, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, keep listening beyond the soundbites.